Ooh, sorry. Ooh, I'm all here, messy here. <laughs> sorry for the little delay there. I was slow getting my other stuff set up. There we go. <laughs> I was I was busy reading my PowerPoint and I'm uh, making sure I was all prepared on what I was going to talk about. So welcome everybody. It's Monday morning, 11 o'clock. Uh, here we are at UB the Behavior Consultant uh, live stream I do every Monday morning and I'm so excited about this topic. That's why I was studying it and uh, thinking about what we're going to talk about today. So I'm very happy that you are here with me today and uh, my gosh, let's get started because it's such a fun morning. As I said, it's UB the Behavior Consultant, the live stream I do every Monday morning at 11 a.m., almost every Monday morning. Uh, all my travel is starting to pick up again, so I'm not here every Monday sometimes. And um, how does this work? I pick a topic for discussion, and you guys get to participate with me, which makes it more fun. So I hope we get some people on here. Um, everybody hasn't hopped on just yet, have they? Oh my goodness. Uh, and you guys get to participate give me your thoughts your experiences and we chat about this topic and then I recap everything at the end I've got some videos to share with you today to help us explore our topic a little bit more and here is what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about counter conditioning and the reason I really wanted to talk about this topic so much is that I think um, a lot of people including myself, sorry, I'm a little tangled here with my um, headphones, have, um, have been taught kind of a interesting, I don't know, picture of what counter conditioning looks like. And I certainly thought this for many, many years. And um, I was really fortunate to meet some people that really help me get a better understanding of this. And so I really thought it would be great to talk about this topic here. And um, and I'm really grateful to the people that have given me more, more insights into counter conditioning. And it's helped my training so much to learn more about this topic. And so I thought we'd get into it today. So if anybody is feeling brave and wants to um, kind of share what they maybe think um, counter conditioning is we could get into a definition and maybe if you have an image of of what it might look like when you're trying to apply it we can talk about that and uh, and then um, maybe there are some people who might have some confusion on this because the words I don't know sometimes they get a little jumbled up and mixed up and I don't know be great to talk about anybody feeling brave anybody feel like sharing a definition <laughs> oh, a uh, hard question. <laughs> I know. I I am so with you because I feel like these words get tossed around a lot in animal training and they sometimes get mixed up with other words and then they get really confusing. So, um that's why I thought it would be a really good one to talk about today and I'm I I looked up some journal articles and found some really cool research that we get to talk about today to help add some clarity to this so we can really understand what's going on there because I think this is one of those topics that really needs to be explored more for animal trainers. You know, it's that it's that thing of going from the scientific community to practical application. And like I said in my post, I think it gets a little bit lost in translation. Um, so Laurie says, changing animals' opinion about something negative to something positive neutral. Well, and I think you're right that we are trying to, you know, kind of, change uh you know the situation that the i hate to i i know this is it's hard to put into words right that that characteristic is what i like to say something or sometimes like can we change that characteristic of the stimulus from maybe um uh, aversive to appetitive or it can go the other direction right um and al says conditioning of an unwanted behavior or response to a stimulus into a wanted behavior or response response by the association of positive actions with the stimulus all right okay and patricia says acclimating a subject to an unfamiliar thing by associating positive reinforcement with it okay and retraining the response to a to a specific stimulus okay so we're so again you know it's hard to put it into specific words isn't it we kind of have a feeling for what we think it it is you know we kind of have this idea we're kind of trying to change this 
association with something to something else like maybe the animal doesn't like this thing and how can we get it to like this thing and how, and what exactly does that mean what does it look like how do we do that what what is it what's the process going on there but it isn't really clear for us animal trainers I think it's kind of fuzzy and that's why I think it's such a great topic to talk about it's hard to put into words isn't it <laughs> I think you guys are, are are kind of helping to illustrate that it's really it's really difficult for us and I think it's just because it hasn't been very clearly articulated for us and um and also because um maybe sometimes the way it's described in the behavior science um even sometimes you know when i was looking through um the material that i was finding in uh in the in the textbooks and even when people were providing a definition say for a journal article they just wanted to put out a quick definition for a journal article that was going to lead into their research project even those definitions were not terribly descriptive they were very brief and I was like mm, well I know it's a little more involved than that but they were just kind of thrown out a little quickie two sentence and I was like mm, it's more than that <laughs> hey Caitlin thanks for joining us yeah so um so I'm I had to do a little bit uh deeper digging to get to a good definition for you so I appreciate that it's tough to find some great words to describe this what about so so maybe beyond a definition does anybody want to share maybe something that you might do if you were you know maybe applying it in in your training situations what it might look like for you maybe that's an easier way to articulate what it what it means to you to use counter conditioning is there something that you might do in your animal training session that you would describe as counter conditioning because we're going to get into um, what it might look like as well or what what animal trainers have been told it looks like maybe we'll we'll put it that way because <laughs> that's that's another thing that we're going to get into as well and then we'll We'll start looking at some more slides here and I'll get into a little bit more detail to you. It's really a fun topic, man, I'll tell you. Um, I think in order for counter conditioning to take place, the animal needs to be in a low state of arousal and or calm. Yeah, that, so that's something that's been um, discussed in the animal training world for sure. For sure, I think that's something that animal trainers have been um, told, which I think is interesting when, as we're gonna get into this topic. I think it's really interesting. And a, and a good point for us to discuss. Anyone anyone else have some thoughts to add to that? It's going to be so mind blowing for you guys. I'm telling you, it's going to be mind blowing. <laughs> which I which is what I love about the the science and um, and again trying to bridge the gap between uh, the science and what we're doing. But you know. That's the, that's the fun of going to school and getting a chit chat with all these uh, cool people that, that we uh, know in behavior science. Ah, I'm hoping uh, Sean and Masa are going to join us today. I don't know if they're on here, but they always are, are good ones too for helping with this stuff. All right. I, I hope you're all tapping away here. Well, well while you're, you're tapping away and thinking about scenarios in which you've tried to apply this, why don't I... I go ahead and get into a definition and this is um, and this will kind of lead into our practical application and what it looks like so um, so here is um, the behavior science definition oh, oh here we go I'm um, pairing positive reinforcement with calm and fearless behavior when trying to get an animal to be neutral or like some well like something it sees as scary like african gray parrot with new nail clippers okay so you're uh, and so maybe i'll interpret this a little bit so you're thinking about pairing something appetitive with a calm calm behavioral response um when it sees something that it finds aversive like an aversive stimulus okay and i would say that's kind of a a typical um typical scenario that animal trainers um counter conditioning and that'll be an example that i think i'll talk through as well, um, you know, sort of the introduction of an object that, that an animal finds aversive. So that's a good example that we'll talk about. So thanks for sharing that. 
All right, so let's get into our definition here, and then we'll talk about some practical application things. So those, those are good one. Okay, so counter conditioning in, in animal training, and this is um, this is really you know the behavior science definition. So it does involve pairing a stimulus with another stimulus. So the stimulus that we're um, usually pairing is usually considered an, an aversive, but it can go the other direction. So usually we're pairing a stimulus that con is considered aversive with a stimulus that is appetitive, such as food. So that's like, you know, the nail clippers and maybe pairing the nail clippers with food. But here's something that's really, really important to remember. What's important is the temporal relation of the stimulus-stimulus pairing. That means that the animal contacts these two stimuli at the exact same time. So what does that mean? It's not that you, that you just present these two stimuli at the same time, that the animal contacts them at the same time. So did it eat the food at the exact same time that you presented the aversive stimuli? And was it aware of the aversive stimulus at the same time? So this is where we get a, we have to get around that sort of distraction training. You know, did you just keep it busy with the food or did it actually have an awareness of the aversive stimuli at the same time it or stimulus at the same time that it contacted the appetitive stimulus? So this part really matters, okay? So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Now here's the other part that's gonna throw things off a little bit for y'all <laughs> and help you really wrap your brain around counter conditioning. So by definition, the observed behavioral response of the animal doesn't dictate when the stimulus-stimulus pairing and the contact occurs, okay? Um, all right, so what that means is this is a respondent conditioning procedure, not operant. So what that, oh yeah, you're right, it is blurry. I don't know why it's blurry. Hmm, it might mean that my internet connection is not so good right now. Huh, interesting. Sorry about that. It could be my, it could be my internet connection. Although it's, it's only blurry on, um, one of my things it's not blurry on my phone but it's blurry on my computer interesting i don't know um ah, for me it's okay okay it might be it might be an internet connection thing there um because it's not blurry on my phone but it's blurry on my computer so it might be inter internet connection for some um okay but going back to that definition there so this is the part about um the uh, observed behavioral response of the animal does not dictate when the stimulus pairing and contact occurs. So this one is really important <laughs> for the definition of counter conditioning. So, so when we talk about what the animal is doing, like it being calm and relaxed, technically that is not criteria for counter conditioning. So counter conditioning is non-contingent. So what that means is we don't care what the animal is doing when that stimulus-stimulus pairing occurs. So this is a biggie, all right? And so what that means is what's going on there? How does the animal overcome this fear response? The way we think it's working is actually an extinction procedure. So the animal gets exposed to this aversive stimulus and it's just basically going through an extinction procedure. And we think the appetitive basically helps overcome that, helps make that extinction pr process go a little bit faster. So, but you know, as animal trainers, our goal really is to change the characteristic of that aversive stimulus to at least neutral and hopefully appetitive. Um, right, and so Caitlin says, um, right, so it's not an operant learning state of mind and it's um, in a classic, yeah, so it's a respondent procedure, it's not operant. And so, so we're gonna now look a little bit more at the practical application to help, um, uh, well, we'll look at practical application in the way that trainers often think of counter conditioning and um, explore these practical application procedures a little bit to kind of see, is it really counter conditioning? All right. So keep all these in mind for, for this definition of counter conditioning. 
And now we'll take a look at some of the things that we have often been told are counter conditioning, right? So hopefully this one won't be blurry for you all. <laughs> so we've often been told that um, counter conditioning looks like these two examples here. So um, two common examples are walking up to the enclosure and dropping a treat in the bowl and walking away, right? So like if that animal is not comfortable with you, if you just walk up to the enclosure, drop a treat in the bowl and walk away, that's counter conditioning or giving food to the animal at the same time you carefully introduce an aversive stimulus. So those are two really common scenarios that we've been saying, we've been told, hey, that's counter conditioning. And you know, I've, so I've, I've said those before myself and I'm gonna give you some video examples. Um, so let's see, um, let me read some of your comments. Oh, I see, I feel that the prey animal must be calm, fearless enough to accept the food reward. I feel like an animal that is really afraid doesn't want to eat. Oh, that's a really good comment. Yes, I, I love that comment. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so really good point there. You guys are thinking awesome. I love the way you think. Uh, so let's look at these scenarios and break them down a little bit because this will really help us understand what's going on. So let's look at the first one, walking up to the enclosure and dropping a tree in the bowl and walking away because a lot of people talk about this one and I've talked about it. So let's say we've got this vulture in um, uh, an enclosure so my little square there is is the enclosure and let's say we've got a bowl right there that we can drop some food in we can walk up to the enclosure and drop some food there and we're going to say that our person in green here is an aversive stimulus and the bird is afraid of this man okay so if we, you know, like I said, people call this counter conditioning, the man's going to walk up, drop food in the bowl and walk away. All right. We got to ask ourselves some questions based on our slide there before. The man, and, and again, you really got to think about this. Um, so we've got our bird. Let's say our bird is standing in the corner and our man walks up. What is our bird doing when the man walks up? You know, it doesn't really matter, right? And let's say our man walks up and drops food in the bowl. At that exact moment, what is our bird doing? We, you know, let's say the bird is just standing in the corner. At that exact moment when the man walks up and drops food in the bowl, that bird is not making contact with the aversive and the food, right? And what happens is the man walks away, right? And also what happens is there's a delay between the bird making contact with the food. Typically what happens is the man's gonna walk away after he's dropped the food in the bowl. So let's think about that. So what do you think is going on there? If you think about the response of the bird in, in relation to this person walking up, dropping food and walking away, what's going on is there? The bird is probably frantically trying to get away. It may be, it may not. It just depends on you know how carefully that person walks up, how far away that bird is. But what we really wanna think about is the timing of everything. It's, it, it's really interesting when you think about what's really going on here. And my questions might, might help you think about it. Okay, so good, good one. The bird gets a reward after the man walks away, if, you think about, if you're thinking about the food thing. But what other reinforcer might be going on there? And, you can, and if you think about my um, questions there, you'll see it. Right, so wouldn't that be negative reinforcement of the person walking away? Exactly, exactly. So the first thing that happens is a negative reinforcement contingency. You absolutely got it. The very first thing that happens is that person walks up. Let's say the bird is over here doing something, whatever the bird is doing. The first reinforcement contingency is a negative reinforcement contingency. The person walks up and the bird is doing something and the person walks away. So that behavior, whatever happens 
that whatever is happening right there is a negative reinforcement contingency. And then what probably happens is a positive reinforcement contingency. After this person has left, the bird walks over to the bowl and that walking to the bowl behavior gets reinforced. So it's a combination of negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement contingency. Absolutely contingencies going on there. If the bird is standing still and the person walks away, then standing still is negatively reinforced. You got it, Chris. Yeah, so there is no counter conditioning going on here. It's a, it's a negative reinforcement contingency and a positive reinforcement contingency. You guys totally got it. Yeah, so this whole thing of walk up to the enclosure and drop food in a bowl and walking away is not counter conditioning at all. You guys are so on it. You are so smart. This is totally um, a scenario that utilizes negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. So if you are a, a aware of this and you're a skilled trainer and you carefully watch the animal's body language and you apply it carefully you are actually using the constructional approach and you can you which we've talked about many times and you can create a situation in which the animal is going to be really receptive to appetitives quickly by approaching carefully and trying not to push the animal above threshold get a nice calm animal approach carefully with your your um, negative reinf and and remove yourself when that animal's calm and relax and also you'll have the combo of the negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement contingency using the constructional approach and so you have a non-coercive application of negative reinforcement for the win so use your contingencies carefully and wisely so there you go <laughs> and so chris thinks because we got it because our teachers because of our teachers lessons no it's because you guys were you're looking at the right things so so you know again you know if we are looking for our contingencies if we're not so narrowly focused on just positive reinforcement we'll see it um, what if we installed a food giving device like a pet tutor to deposit treats as we're walking up to the enclosure and the animals able to be calm and eat while we walk up? Yeah, it's, it's fine. You know, you can, you can include that as well. I, I don't, I don't have a problem with trying to include, um, remote feeders as well, but we also want to remember what is the, the function based intervention, right? So if we know that humans are an aversive stimulus, um, we want to remember to use our function-based intervention. So, you know, I think um, one of the things that, you know, a few of us have been talking about a lot is like if a scary person is chasing you, food never overrides, you know, your fear response. What the animal wants is distance. You know, I don't want a cookie when a man with a gun is chasing me. I want the man with the gun to go away. So we still want to give the animals what they want. And so if the scary man doesn't go away, then you know it, it doesn't really work. So if we can teach the animal they have the power to make the scary man go away by relaxing, I, it makes our our appetitives more re you know have more value. You know, so we we want to use both those interventions. I think I think it's powerful to use both of those contingencies because they they exist. You know, it's a, it's it's not contrived. You know, we know the person is an aversive. It's it's a naturally existing. Um, uh, um, reinforcer in this situation so we can still use it in a non-coercive way and so I'll, I'm gonna play this video and actually I can talk over it um, so even though I'm not using food because these animals are so far away they're at the opposite end of the enclosure I, even if I dropped food in there it wouldn't matter to the animal <laughs> because they're so far away but you know this is essentially the same idea these are hemsbach that are at the back end of the enclosure um, and so i'm just walking up and retreating but i'm doing it based on body language that i see so this is a negative reinforcement contingency but if you wanted to you know add dropping in food through the bars i guess you could you know um, but it's the same you know visual uh, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm approaching and retreating based on the body language of the animals using a negative reinforcement contingency to teach this wild caught herd of hemsbach, which is a, um, you know, kind of antelope, um, that they can, that they can cause me to go away, you know, by giving certain body language and most of it is basically them, I'm approaching and retreating based on them being very calm and relaxed. 
and um, I might turn the volume down a little. And and again, you know, tossing food probably would be irrelevant because they are so far away. And um, if we are teaching an animal to relax in order to remove an aversive stimulus, are we not teaching them to potentially mask their behavior when they are feeling upset? So with the constructional approach, what we do is we start so far away that when they, um, all they have to do, is, and actually in this example, they don't even show me any overt um, signs of showing um, uh, any signs of being concerned. So with the hoof stock, be, um, I, and I don't know if you've seen any of my constructional approach stuff, Caitlin, um, the idea is you start so far away that the kind of um, sign that they might show is literally like, you know, lifting their head to look at you or a, a little tiny glance. You're, you're, the idea is that they barely acknowledge your existence. And when I'm working with a herd of hoofstock, I actually don't even look for any overt body language. I, I will approach and retreat on calm um, body language because if any animal shows any sign of concern, the whole herd might start to move away from me. So I basically approach and retreat when they are just calm and relaxed. And what I ended up getting in this is that um, animals would start approaching me and I would retreat on the approach. And then I got to the point where I could stand there for 10 seconds. With these animals, you couldn't even get, you couldn't even stand at that fence at all and they would all move to the other pen. So um, so yeah, you might like my all, all my stuff on the constructional approach so you can see like how, you know, how minuscule the responses that you are, um, in terms of an animal responding to you that you are acknowledging so you don't you don't get any masking of body language whatsoever whatsoever because you're you're not even they're barely acknowledging your presence and there if you go to caawt.com for the constructional approach for animal welfare and training you'll you'll see a whole lot more on the constructional approach which um, um, offers a whole lot more information on how that whole procedure is applied in a lot more detail also from um, Jesus Rosales Ruiz and um, Sean Will and Masa Nishimuta and um, Joe Lang so some really um, more in-depth resources than I have as well and they have a lot of good really uh, really good dog training examples so I know you're doing a lot of work with dogs as well so you might really enjoy that so just some more ref resources for you all right so let's talk about the other example of giving food to the animal at the same time as you carefully introduce an aversive stimulus. So usually this involves an object as the aversive stimulus. The object is slowly presented and food or other or another appetitive is delivered at the same time as long as the animal remains calm and relaxed. And so this is kind of the um, nail trimmer example that Lori presented. And if the animal shows body language indicative of discomfort, um, the, the object is removed and so are the appetitives. So, um, so in this example, what we want to think about in terms of does it qualify as counter conditioning is are the aversive stimulus and the appetitive stimu stimulus presented and contacted simultaneously and does the behavior of the animal matter in this application so those are the things that we want to think about uh, in terms of it qualifying as counter conditioning um, and and i guess actually well, I guess I can give away the end. Well, let's let's look at some video and then we'll we'll, we'll look at that answer there. So this is a longer video um, with an orangutan where I was just showing like, could we introduce scissors? Um, not that we need to ever really introduce scissors to the animal necessarily, but it was just an, a weird object. And and so you're going to see how I might introduce this weird object. It's a little bit longer video, but you'll kind of get the idea.
Okay, I'm going to um, stop that one because you kind of get the idea. Uh, and just a quick response to Caitlin's thing. I know I typed it in the messaging there, but um, Caitlin was saying about the having seen one of the video clips with a um, proboscis monkey, I think, where where she was worried that, uh, well, I don't know if you're worried. I think I put that word in your mouth there. <laughs> Um, we're wondering if they would learn to, again, if they would mask the aggressive body language. And I don't know if you remember in that video, but what he started doing is he actually decreased um, showing aggressive responses, and that's what I was reinforcing. And to me, it's kind of exactly opposite, is that they actually learn that, um, that wow, you know, I, 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 you know, somebody's actually responding to my aggressive body language and uh, you know, a, a decrease in, in or that they don't have to use aggressive body language in order for somebody to go away i think what's um been reinforced heavily in the past is that they just have to escalate an aggressive behavior to get people to do anything and so that's the whole idea with the constructional approach is that you are teaching them by starting so far away that they have the opportunity to present um, desired responses you're working so below threshold that they have the opportunity to present calm responses so that you can reinforce those and so they learn that oh my gosh I don't have to scream and yell at you or show excessive fear responses or stress, excessive um, um, uh, aggressive behavior in order to get you to go away and that's the whole idea that's the whole idea of um, these constructional approaches things and so that that we do um, get to reinforce desired responses that's the whole whole gist of it all and um, that's why it, that's why it works and so you're finally it's like you're fine it's it's kind of like they're saying oh my god they finally are listening to me that's the way i see it is that these animals are going finally somebody's listening to me instead of me having to shout at them so they're finally getting someone to listen to their their body language <laughs> so that's that's the way that I see it. Anyway, so let's look at some more examples. Um, I know you guys have seen this one before, but I I look at it now in a completely different light. So you're going to see this giraffe um, touching a target, and um, and I used to call this systematic desensitization and counter conditioning, and I don't now. And we're going to look at it, and I'll t and I'll tell you why. Um, I call it something completely different. And I also, and you guys maybe recall me calling it PPCC, Pairing Procedure with Calm Criteria, because I didn't have a name for it, but now I know the words for it. <laughs> so let's watch it, and then I will tell you what the correct words are for it. All right, so you're going to see her um, feeding, feeding, feeding while she slows, slowly introduces this target. And now think about all those things I told you about counter conditioning and we'll see if it meets the definition. And then I'll explain why it doesn't. <laughs> Or maybe you guys can explain why it doesn't. What what were some of the criteria that I said needed to happen in order for this to be counter conditioning? There's two main ones that it doesn't meet. And so, of course, now it's transi transitioned into operant. It's transitioned to positive reinforcement. The animal touches the target first and then gets the food. But prior to that, what was going on was not systematic desensitization and counter conditioning. This part here. Although I used to call it that all the time, but it's not what it was. Okay, so, it, and it's not distracted by food. It's um, reward the object contact always at the same time, right? So, so it didn't meet that criteria. The aversive is not presented at the same time as the food, right? So it did not meet that criteria. You're right. So that was one of our things that needs to, for it to be um, counter conditioning. So this, the aversive stimulus and the food were not 
um, uh, pre presented and contacted at the same time. So that did not happen. You are correct. And um, the other part that is not occurring, which I'll just go into here, is is that um, I do care about or Wendy does care about what the animal is doing. So we do care about the animal's body language. So we do want a calm and relaxed animal. So that means there's a shaping procedure going on. So um, so in this example, in the previous one as well, there what's going on is stimulus fading with the target. So we're fading the, the stimulus in. So we did not present the object at the same time, as you guys noted. And we're, um, we're introducing it in a manner that does not elicit a fear or aggressive response. And um, the appetitive is presented first. That was the food and the stimulus is faded in. And this also allows appetitives to be delivered contingent on calm responses. Therefore, this is primarily a shaping procedure using positive reinforcement and stimulus fading. So that is actually what is going on there. And that is also what was going on with the orangutan. So it's not really, um, a counter conditioning procedure not I mean there is a you know a little element of counter conditioning that happens at some level at some point in the procedure but mostly it is shaping with positive reinforcement and stimulus fading and that is also what you'll see in this bear example that I'm going to show you here and um, and then we'll talk about what counter conditioning really looks like um, in in a lab example Touch. That was a no. That was a no. Thank you. She's a little far. Touch. That's a wonder. Touch. Touch. I'm going to try and touch first. I think I need to deliver up. Touch. Great. That was awesome. Okay. Got the idea? Well, she reacted a little bit, right? Because that was new. Good. That was good. good. A reaction. Yeah. I think that she kind of sniffed it. I'm just going to leave it here for a minute. So they're fading in this stick because it's new, so it hasn't touched her yet. So again, stimulus fading. And, and uh, same thing, so a stimulus fading and working towards touching and then feeding afterwards, so a shaping procedure. So again, you can see it's a combination of things, right? So we're not, it's not, you know, there's, there's shaping, there's stimulus fading, there can be some counter conditioning going on there, um, but it's not pure counter conditioning, I guess is where I'm going to with that. So you just wanna see all those different things happening. All right, ho hopefully that was a little clearer for people there. So let's look at what counter conditioning really would look like <laughs> all right so so here's what really happens so you know not pleasant to think about but picture this rat in this box here so it's been trained to press that little bar to get food the grid that it's sitting on actually can deliver shock and so when it presses the bar shock and food can be delivered at the exact same time and so what was done in this study was to show that when the rat presses the bar, if shock and food are delivered at the same time, the rat can learn to still continue to press that bar. However, the more delay that was added to when food was delivered, 
the more the rat would start to stop pushing that bar. So, so what they really showed in this study by Williams and Barry in 1966 is that the more distance there is, the more time delay there is between food, between when that shock is delivered and the rat presses the bar and, um, and uh, well, I should say this, the more delay there is between when the shock happens and the food is delivered, the less likely that rat is going to press the bar. So this is that part that I was talking about, especially with, um, you know, the person walking up and dropping food in the bowl. If that animal is not contacting food and the person at the exact same time, then that's not counter conditioning, right? That's why we're seeing, you know, contingencies happening there. If, if you're trying to introduce an object and the animal is not contacting the object and food at the exact same time, you slowly introducing that object, that's stimulus fading. That's not counter conditioning until you're, the animal's contacting the object and the food at the exact same time. So that's, not, that's when counter conditioning kicks in. And the fact that you are concerned about how the animal is responding, that also brings something else into the equation right so that's why we have to think about well where is the counter conditioning actually happening it's happening at a very specific moment in time and um, all those other things are relevant as well so so these are important things for us to consider we're we're often not in real life in a situation where all those you know the shock and the food and the contact are happening all at the same time so things for us to um, consider so you know when when do we think about actually you know considering counter conditioning well there are situations in our life when counter conditioning can be helpful to our animals when there's no way that that aversive stimulus can be you know, avoided or removed, you know, often we're setting up situations in which we can manipulate the environment, but sometimes we can't, you know, like sometimes there are medical procedures where we're restraining animals and we maybe can't manage the situation very well. Um, you know, that might be a time when we can um, try to add some sort of appetitive to that situation. But even in that, in that situation, we're still doing some operant stuff, you know, to be quite honest. Sometimes we're putting animals in confined spaces for transport or travel, and the animals haven't been quite trained for that. And we try to do some counter conditioning there. Um, there are aversive events that we can't control, like um, thunderstorms and construction work, maybe loud noises like sirens. But again, there are still things we can do to try to address those things and oftentimes animals you know habituate as well um, which again is you know really an extinction procedure too <laughs> um, aversive events um, uh, but and, you know, and again like I was saying even in these situations you are still often selectively reinforcing for calm responses with both negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement um, you know like even in a restraint procedure you know we can we can negatively reinforce calm responses by not putting so much pressure on the animal when they relax a little bit so um you know even these can be better than counter conditioning and prolonged exposure to the aversive stimuli which again is using this extinction pr procedure in the presence of the appetitive so that's one of the things in one of the studies that they talk about is that you know even though you may be presenting this appetitive and being like look look here's an appetitive you're having to expose the animal to an aversive for a long time in the presence of the appetitive to try to get this extinction response um, of a fear response or an aggressive response. And that is that stimulus picture that I've shown people before that isn't very nice. You know, think about this animal in the, showing this fearful state and you're and you know, it's fighting through this fear response to take your food and you're waiting for it to like have this extinction response of, of a fear response this respondent extinction which is not a pretty picture you know the animal fighting through that fear response when instead you might use something like the constructional approach where you haven't put it into that elevated fear response where you've got basically the slightest little hint of you know oh, I'm uncomfortable and it relaxes and you back off that's a much nicer stimulus picture than the animal that's going oh I want I guess I want your food but I have to put up with this scary thing I'd much rather start way farther away and have the animal go oh 
I don't know about that. And then it relaxes and then I remove the aversive. To me, that's a much more pleasant stimulus picture than having to go through that respondent extinction. I don't know. I would much prefer that. Um, so uh, another condition when operant conditioning may simply not be an option, but in real life, it's probably not that common if you look for the um, non, uh, uh, you, when you look for the nonlinear analysis of behavior, you often see the contingencies like I showed you with the walking up to the enclosure and dropping the food in. There really is contingencies there. You just need to look for them. <laughs> you know, it's just being aware of them. So, so that's the the thing is you just get better at finding the contingencies when you start looking for them more often. So, I'll show you this video, but to be honest, it's not really like I said, it's not, you know, there's there's definitely contingencies going on. But um, this is a uh, Sirocco, the kakapo, the parrot that we worked with in New Zealand, and we just started, you know, working on him for some behaviors for his um, health care. And, you know, granted, he's eating the whole time that we're right. doing a little There's restraint procedure on him. But as you can sure. see, you know, we're still very concerned with is he calm so and relaxed. We weren't going to keep doing like that if he wasn't showing us relaxed behavior. So it still is like contingencies so so going on there. It's not really counter conditioning um, by awesome. definition. But uh, but those are those things that, you know, we often talk yeah, about, you know, can we make medical procedures a little less right. um, aversive but just by, feeling all you know, this transmitter, letting them right. eat food while we do some of these things that require manipulating body parts and, um, and whatnot. So he's just chowing down on pine nuts. But again, like I said, you know, we are paying attention to his body language and we certainly wouldn't proceed if he was showing um, any uh, evidence of wanting to escape or avoid those procedures. So it's not a true counter conditioning situation. Um, but again, just some thought, food for thought. All right. So look at that. I didn't think we'd go through this quite so fast. You, you all didn't have a lot of comments for me. So some recap. Um, so I think counter conditioning has been really misunderstood by a lot of us in, in the animal training industry, mostly just just due to information. I don't think it's anybody's you know fault or anything like that. We've just received misinformation and you know kind of some. I think it's hard sometimes to describe what it looks like. You know, we get some information and then we go, oh, well, this is how you apply that. You know, so that, that idea of dropping food in a bowl and walking away, you know, kind of sounds like, oh, well, that's what it is. But when you an analyze it, you can see all the contingencies. And simply, you know, and that idea of simply pairing an appetitive with something are, are, are really just kind of simplifications um, of it but if you dig deeper you can really see the contingencies and hopefully that's what we did for for today hopefully you could see the contingencies now um, so yes it does involve a stimulus stimulus pairing but there really are some specific conditions that must be met in order for it to really be counter conditioning and in real life we really don't have that situation for trainers and they wouldn't really be practical for us to really meet our training goals and animal welfare. So I would say, you know, when you're talking about counter conditioning in your animal training, recognize that you're really probably using a lot of operant, um, uh, operant conditioning procedures, to be honest. Um, and uh, maybe counter conditioning is like there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly you're probably doing operant conditioning. Um, and Williams and Barry demonstrated counter conditioning. Um, uh, it really needs to have a temporal relationship. And um, that's really, really important um, for it to, to be working. So, you know, those things need to be happening at the exact same time. And that animal needs to contact that at the exact same, same time. It's not just about presenting it. Um, and... Uh, Oh, and I thought this was really important too. And studies have shown that the impetitive reinforcer is more efficient if it is delivered contingent upon responses that compete with avoidance behavior. Basically, what that says is you should reinforce what you want to see, calm responses. And that can be also with negative reinforcement, as we were discussing. So, so you know, just use reinforcement. <laughs> use positive and negative reinforcement for what you want to see so um and for those of you that are in um, animal training fundamentals i will put these um references um, these journal articles in the education program so you can check out those articles 
And so how is this working? A st extinction of avoidant, avoidance, aggression, and undesired responses when they're engaging with the appetitive um, is what's um, happening really. And, and so we do that as animal trainers, but generally we're trying to do that with the animal below threshold. So that's why there's a shaping process involved. And, and that's why there um, can be problems with using counter conditioning because we're basically asking an animal to kind of fight through this fear response. We're saying, you know, here, eat this food while you're really, really scared of that aversive stimulus. And that's why, you know, sometimes counter conditioning isn't always the best choice. You know, um, you saw in my video clips that the way that I get around this is I use that stimulus fading process of really introducing that aversive so slowly and I'm also using the shaping procedure of saying okay you know I'm gonna reinforce you for being super super calm but as I was pointing out the constructional approach can offer an alternative um, that may be less um, coercive you know, that's why we've been talking a lot about the constructional approach. So that instead of have, asking that animal to fight, go through that extinction process and be exposed to this aversive stimulus where it may be going, I don't really want to eat your cookie in the presence of that scary thing. I might consider the constructional approach instead. And um, those of you who have watched my presentation where I, I show the cockatoo um, and I'm asking it to touch the the syringe and it's kind of leaning away and going okay I'll touch that I'll come over and touch that versus having trained my blue-throated macaw using the constructional approach to touch a target you can really see the body language difference so you know those are things to consider so counter conditioning may be helpful under certain circumstances however we are likely we likely are still using operant procedures and other tactics to help our animals succeed and provide optimal animal welfare ultimately we have a lot of tools available to us in most cases to draw upon that we are using that are function based to address fear and aggressive responses and that's kind of referring back to the constructional approach so there you go that is your your um deep i guess deep dive into uh into um, uh, counter conditioning and uh, hopefully giving you a little better clarification as to what it really is and um, you know when we might use it what are some options and what it looks like compared to looking at contingency based interventions and how we're really kind of you know walking in the land of all these different things going on all these different um, uh, tactics going on uh, and Edda says I've tried it and it also works works much faster um, considering a contingency based intervention versus the um, counter conditioning uh, yeah it's it's really interesting stuff to explore and I hope it's given you some food for thought um, yeah um, I feel so much smarter <laughs> thanks Barbara says Chris yeah it's really fun I I really enjoy diving into these topics Topics. And, uh, you know, for me, it was it was really fun to look at my own training and expe especially, um, you know, breaking that down, because for a long time I've wanted I, you know, like I, you know, like I said, I called that thing the PPCC because I didn't know what it was. And it took me a while to be like, oh, now I know what that is. And and also the walking up and dropping food in the bowl. You know, um, I recently watched a video of somebody doing that. I went and I analyzed it like step by step and, and it like you know my head just had I had a light bulb moment when I went oh my god I know what's going on there those are totally contingencies total and you know like when you can see the contingencies you feel like your world is just like you know it's like opened up you know I, I think I did this in one of my presentations before where your world goes from black and white to color like you just suddenly see everything and it makes sense and that is just so um, it's such an amazing feeling when that's happening and so I hope that's happening for you a little bit today so that you can start to see these a little bit better and um yeah, it's just a, it's such a cool feeling. All right, guys. Uh, so speaking of co hidden contingencies, uh, so I recently did this presentation for Yaza, and it's now available in um, AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com: The Secret Life of the If Then Contingencies or Contingency: Six Hidden Ways the Four Quadrants Are Impacting Your Training. So this course 
It's, it's not a long one. It's about um, half an hour. But uh, it, it kind of will show you how to find these contingencies, where they are in your animal training. And so many people just see positive reinforcement. But like as we just discussed today, you will find that these contingencies are everywhere. And you just want to start getting comfortable looking for them and not be afraid of them. And um, so this is a great course. And you can earn a badge for this course um, if you are a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. And uh, the hands-on animal training workshop that we're doing up at Frank Buck Zoo in November 29th, um, it is definitely selling out. We Now we only have six spots left, so I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. And the way that you can get in on that is uh, go to frankbuckzoo.com and just look for special events. And, um, uh, and um, Jim Mackey, he is going to talk about Money Talks, the Economic Value of Zoo Animal Training for our Global Online Animal Training Summit. So I wanted to draw your attention to that. And if you are not yet a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, you are missing out, man. We now have 81 live streams in there in addition to all our amazing courses. And uh, you can still join and participate at 25% off. I haven't taken off this discount yet because, man, we are still in COVID times. Um, so you can get that discount by going to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, pick a membership option, enter the code SUNGLASSES, and you will get that discount. And there you go. All right. Oh, and what do we have? This has definitely given me a lot to think about, says Sully. Good. That's the point. We want people thinking. So we just keep raising the bar in our animal training community, and I love it. That is the point. We are not done as a community. We are not done, done growing and learning, and that is what we're all about here. So um, very excited about that. Uh, so cool. All right. And Lori says thank you. Awesome, guys. Um, I have to say next week um, there will not be a live stream. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh doing some more zoo consulting so i i will not be able to broadcast um next week so i will look forward to speaking with you the week after and we'll talk about some other cool subject i have no idea what it will be just yet <laughs> but i hope to see you not next monday monday but the monday after all right guys it is exactly 12 we did great on our time and hopefully the sound was much better this week <laughs> <laughs> all right okay guys uh, i will look forward to talking to you in a couple weeks and we'll see you next time thank you bye